We will bring this special assembly meeting to order for April 13th. Um, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Assembly Member Bryson. Present. Assembly Member Hale. Here. Assembly Member Hughes Scandies. I believe Ms. Uh, Ms. Scandies is currently uh, absent. Correct. Assembly Member Smith. Here. Assembly Member Treem. Here. Assembly Member Wall. Present. Assembly Member Wachlal Gadok. Here. Assembly Member Gladyshevsky. Here. Madam Mayor. Here. Ms. Hale, were you called? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought we I thought we missed you in roll call, but never mind. Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, Mr. Bryson, would you do our land acknowledgement, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. We would like to acknowledge that the city and borough of Juneau is on Clinkett land and wish to honor the indigenous people of this land. For more than 10,000 years, Alaska Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well-being of our community. We are grateful to be in this place, a part of the community, and to honor the culture, traditions, and resilience of the Clinkett people. Gunalshish. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Um, other, we don't have any special order of business other than the instructions for public participation. So we'll go right to, is there any public participate on non-agenda items? Madam Mayor, I do not believe anybody signed up via Zoom uh, or prior to testify via Zoom. And I do not believe anybody has signed up to testify in person. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. So that brings us to agenda topics. Item A, Madam Clerk. Resolution 2983, a resolution authorizing the manager to enter into port agreements with cruise line corporations for the purpose of satisfying requirements of the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention to allow cruise ships that have opted into the program for cruise lines operating in U.S. waters to visit the Port of Juneau in calendar year 2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Manager. Last year, the Center for Disease Control required all cruise lines operating foreign flagships in U.S. waters to sign port agreements with communities where the ships were scheduled to call. This year, the CDC's program is voluntary but remains largely the same. Cruise lines opt into or out of the entire program. They cannot pick and choose between COVID mitigation measures. CLIA Alaska and its member lines have all opted into the program and all foreign flag ships calling in Juneau will operate under port agreements. This resolution authorizes the city manager to sign those port agreements on behalf of CBJ. I recommend you adopt this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Is there any member of the public wishing to speak to this resolution? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it to the assembly. Ms. Glashevsky. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would move uh, resolution, no number. Oh, uh, 2983 and ask for unanimous consent. Any objection? <clears throat> Seeing none, that resolution is approved. We are adjourned. calling the assembly finance committee meeting of april 13th to order I'd like to thank the finance department for once again ensuring sunny weather on us on a wednesday it's a good aurora forecast today so somebody will have to stay up late and see that for me okay ms spiegel will you please note our role 
Thank you, Chair Treem. We have all assembly members present in chambers besides assembly member Wall and assembly member Hughes Scandies. Assembly member Hughes Scandies is absent and assembly member Wall is present virtually via Zoom. Thank you. Any objections to the minutes from April 6th? Seeing none, those are approved. I do want to say um, they're really good minutes. So if you haven't read them, Kate has done a wonderful job and it probably will be helpful as we move through this process to remind ourselves what we did the week before. So on to agenda topics. Our first topic is the Juno School District. Uh, Mr. Rogers, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Chair Treem. Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm, I'll pass this to the school district as quickly as I can. Um, we've had a little bit of confusion between uh, CBJ Finance and the school district about some of the budget numbers. Um, I don't, I wouldn't get, overly focused on those tonight. We'll clean those up as we move through the process and make sure that the assembly understands exactly what you're appropriating and where. Uh, but some of the numbers in the letter won't line up with this in the budget book, which is just a little bit of chafing around the edges. We'll, we'll work through that. But um, other than that, I think I would pass it to the school district. Okay. Come on up. And this item is being presented to us for review. We don't need to make any decisions on this tonight, but this is a chance to ask questions if you have them. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to wait until you've got the slides ready or should we just Yeah. Okay. Chair Treem, while we're in a little, little limbo here, I might um, not to steal anybody's number, but this is Miss Olin's first time with us here at finance. So <laughs> people should welcome her and be, be nice. <laughs> nice to meet too. <laughs> and me. <laughs> so I will just start quickly to say, we're just really, we are yeah. We are very happy to be here tonight, and we are especially happy to be here in person and see live faces and eyes. And it's just, it is, uh, it is wonderful to be moving forward and um, and and to be talking to you tonight about budget because it really does drive all the really important work that we do. So um, we are going to have uh, President uh, Dr. Sidden begin. And um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Cassie Olin, who has just finished her first year with the Juno School District and, um, and is managing a lot of different uh, projects right now and doing them all famously well. So we're really happy to have her on our team. So with that, we'll go ahead and start President Sidden. Sure, thank you, good evening. I'm happy to be here, glad to see all of you. Thank you for having us. Um, I'll just start by saying, you know, we definitely certainly want to acknowledge the support that the assembly has given to our schools and to our students over the years. Um, as is on the slide in FY22, that amounted to over 27 million in our operating funds. Um, those are dollars to students in classrooms. So we appreciate that. And the continued support outside the cap, of course, for programs uh, like community schools and rally many of the topics we have talked with you about, uh, you know, multiple times throughout the year and over the year. So appreciate that continued support. And in our, you know, request tonight and, and through these conversations, we'll ask for you to consider continuing that support to the cap for our students. If we can go to the next slide, I think it's just a quick um, touch on our strategic plan. You've probably seen this before, but this really has been our guiding document through the pandemic and was the guiding document through our budget process this year. So we have these four pillars, equity, achievement, partnerships, and relationships. Uh, in hindsight, we maybe sort of lucked out to have just finished writing this as the pandemic hit. And it was fortuitous because it really became that sort of guiding light. Like these, the, we knew what we were, we had sort of level heads when we wrote it and we had it in place to sort of remind us and keep us focused on what those priorities were. And we continue to look to that and make sure that when we're drafting our budget, we are aligning it with those goals that we set for ourselves. 
So with that, I will hand it over to, uh, I think, either Dr. Weiss or uh, Ms. Owen. Thank you. Uh, I also should mention that we also have a board member, uh, our uh, a, uh, Brian Holst in the room as well in person. And I, we may have some online too, but that's a little beyond my capacity right now to figure that out. <laughs> but thank you, Brian, for joining us. Um, our process is really long. We actually start our budgeting process in November and we prioritize a lot of input. So we, we start as early as November, we bring our site councils all together from all of our schools. We talk to them about the budgeting process. Um, we um, solicit some input from them at that time. Then we bring that whole group back together um, in uh, January. And we do that again, but we have more specific conversations. We talk about our strategic plan. We talk about elementary, middle, and high schools, and we break them into small groups. And we have them help us identify what our most effective strategies are that they want us to continue to support, um, ways that we might be able to become more efficient and reduce expenditures. And that really begins driving this whole public process we have around our budgeting. The board uh, takes all that input. Uh, we try to do our best in estimating uh, things like resources and expenses right, those critical elements of a budget. And we're always a bit at a disadvantage because we don't have all of those answers when we start our, pro when we are here, when we approve our budget. And so um, through also, also throughout that process is a lot of advocacy. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the Hill um, advocating for school funding, uh, forward funding, predictable funding, adequate funding, um, and other educational items. But that all happens, uh, then, the, then the board prioritizes. So they take they're spending and they have to literally put it on a list and they prioritize what is most important. Everything on the list is important, but not everything on the list can make it into the budget. And then they put all those pieces together and we show up here tonight. Um, and so it's quite a process. Um, we have uh, also this time in the mix, it's as we did last year, we have uh, COVID federal dollars that we've applied. So the, the board really used the same process to allocate those dollars. Those dollars, what we have left, will be effective this coming school year and one more school year. So we've tried to take a scaffolded approach and, and spread that uh, over time so that we don't we don't know what the next year is going to bring exactly in terms of our response. And so we've tried to balance that between years and the board has prioritized and allocated funds for this school year and leaving some to do the same with for FY24. We've really focused those dollars on recovery, things like um, PTR. So that means keeping our class sizes to what we can um, and using that money to help that because we know we have a lot of extraordinary learning needs um, as a result of the past uh, couple of years. Uh, we've, we've look at our high school students and say they missed a lot of counseling time that normally we're working and developing plans and having them consider what they're going to do in their future. So we added a college advisor uh, type of program. Um, a variety of things, reading specialists, again, trying to get our achievement at our primary K3 grade band. So we added uh, reading and equity specialists uh, to do some of that work. IT obviously has been a critical response uh, department for us. So there's some uh, technology and IT support built in. And then high school recovery, summer school, again, trying to help students recover from this experience and make sure that they have what they need. Um, when they leave us. And so um, we're doing summer school at elementary and middle, and then also credit recovery summer school at high school level. And that's being paid for out of these federal funds. Mayor Weldon has a question. Yes. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the report. Um, I'll give credit to Ms. Ol Olin because she's new. Um, it was great. Um, so your ESSER funds, you're gonna use them this year and next year. Um, but, and I understand some of them like summer school and guidance and all that kind of stuff, because they're obviously very needed right now, post COVID, but some of these like IT support and uh, district wide SEL trauma informed specialists might be ongoing. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen after these funds are it's a great question and and it and it worries us as well and that's ties to the advocacy on the hill because we've been inadequately funded for many many years and so 
what the federal dollars have, have done is allowed us just a little breathing room to really apply some resources directly to where we see students' needs that have increased. So our declining funding and increasing needs is keeps all of, all of us up at night. Um, we're, that's part of why we're paying attention and not like spending all what we have this year because this will extend our strategies two more years. The funds expire basically at the end of FY24. Um, and then we hope that in the meantime, we can get some additional funding and we can start bridging that as we plan between this year and next year. So some of that could happen next year in the budgeting process where we start pulling some of those positions. you don't spend on people, right? You spend on things. The problem is in this particular case is that our needs are so extraordinary and they're people dependent. Like the, the way that we are going to pull families and students through this pandemic is by adequately providing human resource for their learning and their social and emotional needs. So, um, and it's enough money that, and spread over enough time that we think we can maybe do that and then solve some of that as we go. All righty. Um, some of the key uh, assumptions in regards to our uh, resources for the operating fund is our state foundation funding is going to be at $33,440,700. That is uh, based upon the current BSA of 5930 It is also based on a projected enrollment of 4,313 students, which is an increase of 82 from FY22's current uh, official enrollment. And there are currently uh, 94 estimated intensive needs students. In regards to the city and borough Juno support, um, it would be roughly 28,491,200. Um, and this is the full support at the cap. Um, and our district refunding request for FY23 um, is required local to the cap and outside the cap. And this is just a breakdown of all of our operating revenues. As you can see, State Foundation makes up 50% of our revenues. Uh, the CBJ appropriation to the cap is 43%. Presenters on behalf is 6%. And what this is, is this is actually a statute that we have to put onto our books in regards to uh, unfortunate statistic error in 2008 that was done. And so the district, because we have TERS and PERS, we have to do uh, book it onto our actual budgets and our audits. It is a net effect. It is money that we cannot touch. We can't expend. It's just in and out. It's roughly $3.6 million for us next year. Um, and it is roughly 6% of our budget. The numbers inside your packet reflect that. So you'll see where there's one number at $66.4 million. And then there's another number that you'll see, which is 62.6 million. That is the difference of the PERS and TERS on behalf. So the 62.6 is the actual resources that we have as the district to expend on our operating costs within the classrooms. 1% uh, is our other revenues. This is made up of our E-rate, which would be our uh, federal reimbursement that we receive for our internet services. Uh, it is a federal uh, charge that is on everybody's cell phone bill, landline bill, and it is actually a regulation fee that goes into the federal government. It is based off our free and reduced rate, and then that helps us offset our internet uh, services that we provide to our schools so that we can have the maximum amount. Um, you would have something similar in your library also because they qualify for E-rate. The other areas of that is made up of our Medicaid reimbursement and then also our uh, tuition that we receive from our preschool students that we have within our Kinder Ready and our integrated pre-K pre programs. And that makes up um, all of our operating fund revenues. One of the biggest changes this year that you'll notice um, that has been kind of uh, stands out is our local contribution change. And this is per AS 1417-410, which is the state statute that regulates the maximum and local, uh, minimum and maximum local appropriation for uh, boroughs. 
So basically what happens um, for the past 10 plus years, the city of Bergerum has always had the additional allowable local to be 23% of our basic need, which is the basic need is what the state funding levels on their side. Um, however, in FY23, because of the loss of enrollment from the past few years have basically compounded and resulted in a decrease to our state aid um, and compounded with the increase of our property value from 2021, uh, we have switched from 23 of this percent of our basic need, which is part of the state foundation formula, to actually the additional two mills of the 2021 tax base. Um, on the screen, you can see the actual how it goes through the state statute. I can walk you through that if you want. Otherwise, it's just a lot of numbers on the screen, but <laughs> it's there if you need it or if you have questions in regards to it. That increase uh, basically comes about... Um, because of the local assessed value has gone up, um, it roughly, uh, it has increased by roughly 720,000 in just the minimum uh, local contribution that needed to be met. And then also because of the two mil increase makes up the rest of that in regards um, at roughly, where is the buying numbers at? Little over 500,000. I don't see it in my paperwork, but um, and so basically, that is the double reason for the increase of the roughly about 1.2 million dollars in our local contribution to the cap. Was that your question, Ms. Glacheski? What's the, what's the number? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if you take all of our funding with all funds, this includes people transportation, our food service, rally, all of our grants that we currently are projected to receive. We have a total funding source of $86 million. Uh, we have funding uses of roughly 86.6 .6 million. It's a drawdown of all of our fund balances of roughly 657,000. The majority of that is actually from our grants that we receive funding ahead of time. Um, it's money that we receive before we actually expend. So it goes into our fund balances and then we use it as we need appropriate as our expenses go out. There is currently no draw on our operating fund balance. Um, and so therefore we are currently set at having a fund balance at the end of the year at roughly $622,000. Uh, let's see. Probably a key point on the fund balance is <clears throat> that by board policy, um, uh, we uh, want a fund balance larger than that. Uh, but to meet all the needs, the board has decided the last couple of, of years to keep it lower. Um, this is some fund balance. A year ago, <clears throat> the board chose to uh, budget, excuse me, I got to take my throat, <clears throat> um, at a zero fund balance. And so this year, you know, that is not really great practice to do long term and so uh, this year the board has found a way to increase that fund balance so the draws are not related to that <clears throat> okay sorry <laughs> Um, so a breakdown for our request of outside the cap funding um, in regards to our K-12 programs, our high school activities, we are requesting $1.2 million, which is an increase of $100,700 over the current year. Our middle school activities, we have $105,000 uh, request, which is $2,800 over the current year. Uh, transportation, we are requesting $150,000, which is a decrease of $100,000. Food services uh, is a request of 75,000, which is the same in status quo of the current year. Uh, for the total K-12 programs, that is roughly $1.5 million. And our other programs that we have, uh, Kinder Ready, we are requesting 450,000, which is $150,000 increase. Uh, this is due to the fact that we currently have a grant that is ending that currently uh, staffs one of our Kinder Ready programs it would uh, supply it actually would pay for a teacher and an aide in that classroom and so in order to continue with those programs at the three elementaries that we currently have we would need that additional funds community schools we are requesting 95,000 which is the same uh, and our learn to swim program uh, this is $50,000 this is a, an actual new item the learn to swim program currently was a required 
uh, operating costs to the district. This was due to the fact of the Diamond Aquatic Center when it was approved through its bond package was supposed to, supposed to be funded by the uh, state and the city. And then also is going to be paid partially by the, uh, the school bond debt reimbursement um, because we were gonna be using it um, for our learn to swim program for all fourth graders to uh, learn to swim and so that they would have that uh, taken care of. Uh, that bond actually expires on the 21st, actually June 30th, 2021. And therefore that requirement is no longer needed uh, due to the state's uh, Department of Education not no longer needing it. Um, and finally, we have Rally, which is $150,000. So our total other programs is 745,000. For a total request outside the cap of $2,275,000, which is an increase of $153,500 from the prior, prior year, which is our current year. So I, our total request for funding for the whole entire package would be $30,766,200, which is an increase of $1,380,100. Ms. Gladyshevsky. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I lost you in the swimming uh, explanation. Yeah. So this was something that was paid for from another source and now needs to be paid for here. What what is that? It, is that what I understood you yes. to say? Yes, and, and it was a required part of the bond. It is not any longer required. However, we feel that living in Juneau, Alaska, we want to continue the Learn to Swim program because it is a really vital support for our families uh, to ensure that every student at some point um, uh, does have the opportunity to learn to swim. Um, and so that's why we have put it here is because we, we would like to continue it even though it is not required. Okay, and then can I just follow up on the extra, so are you saying the above the cap is an extra million or the total, because I counted minus 100 plus 100, so 300 above the cap roughly, is that right? Not but then you said 1.2 million or one something million. So I'm just trying to follow as well. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the 1.38 million is actually the total between the both of them. So the required general school operations, that amount is 1,226,000. Uh, the actually outside the cap uh, is $153,500 increase or the total of 1.3 million. You're welcome. All right, you have questions? Okay. And that, those numbers, Ms. Gladyshevsky are also on page 16 of our packet. So does anybody have questions? Mr. Smith. This is the time for any school district related question, correct? School district related budget question. Budget question, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask about rally, but is I turn it into a budget question. Yes. So you're not asking for any increased funding for rally. I do know you had to shut down a couple sites. Anyway, could you give us just a little update on sure. on, on rally? Absolutely. Um we made a commitment as we continued to look at rally and accrued debt. Um, there's some competing balances in rally where we are trying to run a high quality program for our community, uh, childcare uh, program, and have it be affordable enough for families to be able to participate. So through the pandemic, of course, there, it's been sort of all over the place in terms of participation and enrollment. And so we are highly committed still to making sure that we're running the most effective, fiscally sound, high quality program that's affordable to parents. And to do that, we didn't have people participating at the level that we would want them to. Is that because the cost was too high? Well, if we don't have the cost that high, then it's challenging to run the program. And so what we did was we did an analysis of enrollment this fall and determined that we had too many open spaces. So all of those cost something and it, we're driving that debt up. 
So being uh, stewards of the program and, and fiscally, we went ahead and made a strategic closure of a couple of sites, combined closures. We didn't close, we still had seats for everybody, but we combined. So we went from six sites to four, that reduced our staffing by four people. That therefore gave us fewer expenses to begin trying to minimize that debt. What we will do in the fall, we've never started the school year with less than six sites. Our model has sort of been, we build it and we hope they come. Well, there's a lot of our people, our families going to begin the year in a new place and we're gonna have greater need, we don't know. So rather than building it and hope they come, that's an expensive model. We're going to start with a more restricted version and see if they show up. And if they show up in great numbers and we have waiting lists, then we'll expand. But we're trying to just tighten this up and do it in the most, to decide if we really can run this program for the community or not. Um, because if we can't do it in a way that's affordable to families uh, and provide that high quality childcare, then we're gonna have to look for other options. And so this was our attempt at determining if we could continue to run it um, and not have a debt and have it be portable to parents. Uh, Ms. Wall and then Mayor Weldon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm curious about the decrease in transportation, um, the budget and transportation. What, what is the reasoning for that? The decrease in uh, transportation is uh, in order to we currently do not receive a hold harmless provision in regards to our people transportation like we do in our normal student uh, funding formula that we've received from the state. Uh, currently, as it stands right now, uh, we haven't received a change since FY 2015. Uh, it is currently running a deficit in regards to the uh, people transportation fund. Our hope is that we are able to minimize that debt and to also make uh, efficiencies in regards to the people transportation program in regards to our routes and into our uh, busing contract and other areas that we can explore to make that more efficient and effective for our students. So that is the reason for the decrease at right now. Mayor Weldon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is another rally question. How much does it cost for the parents right now? And when's the last time there was a rate increase? We actually reduced the rate when we consolidated. Uh, so we, in mid-year, we reduced the rate um, down. And I don't have the current number. 575 for before and after care. Um, thank you. I remember that now on my whiteboard. Uh, 575 for before and after care. And so... Um, part of what happens between now and when we open up in August again is we start relooking at costs and we recalculate that. So that number could change by August. Um, and again, that's what we're paying attention to. Like we dropped it as far as we felt like we could in order to see if that made a difference. Was that the driver be be behind or do parents, aren't they, are they not needing it because they have somebody at home who's not working or, you know. Uh, so that is our current rate. <clears throat> well, I'll duck. Yeah, um, back to the transportation question. Um, so, and I'm going to sheepishly ask this as your liaison. Um, what what is in consideration for what it would mean to reduce services? Because I know that some kids in elementary are waking up at seven, you know, having to be at the bus stop at seven a.m. already. So, what is what does that entail exactly? Uh, we don't have plans to reroute to extend. There's there's regulations how long a student can be on a bus, as an example. Um, what we would be looking at are, and continue to look at are efficiencies in routes. And so because ridership changes all the time. So our efficiencies would come more from where the ridership is and combining routes, et cetera, depending on where those the ridership lands each year, that just changes a little bit. And so we always want to you know, be looking at that to make sure that we have the most efficient routes possible without overextending. Uh, you know, depending on where a child lives, there can be some early uh, pickups, but, uh, but our plan is not to turn it over upside down far enough to really extend those or something like that. 
Mr. Smith. Thanks. Just about the rally rates, I, I know I know an issue with with rally and is this there's a there's an error in the state rate that we're doing for this child care program assistance for families that meet certain el income eligibility. We're I deal with that anyway. We push hard and during my J job to try to fix that. Um, so hopefully by fall we can get that done because I know that would that help would make help really significantly. Yep. Yeah. Um, the other thing I just wanted to ask. I had read somewhere about food service and how we're, I think we're free school lunches. Something's happening with school lunch. Could you talk about that a little bit? So I'll say a few things and then Cassie can fix anything I say or add to it. Uh, because of the pandemic, um, the federal support for meals was such that we had free meals for all students. That federal support is going away. And so we will return to our normal operations. Um, what that means is we will charge students for lunches. Um, we have an amazing community and we have a collaborative with uh, United Way, with Juno Community Foundation, where we provide hot breakfast for any student from kindergarten through eighth grade, whether they are economically disadvantaged or not. We ran it one way first and we found that kids really want to eat together and it didn't feel real good for some kids to be going through the line and others not. So we, uh, with their support, have turned it into a free hot breakfast for all. Um, and so that's a huge support and we do hope that that will continue. But the regular lunch program where we have free and reduced lunch applications, where some students will get it at a reduced rate, some will get it free, and then some will pay. That regular system should return in August. Okay, I have an I have a rally question. Also, um, I'm envisioning kind of like a math problem, where you take the total cost of rally, and you find the minimum number of students at the minimum tuition that would make it work. And that would be a math problem It might not work in the real world. But have you done anything like that to see what those numbers might be? Yeah, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, but um, in order to, there's just a lot of factors. That's one of them. We don't have a singular childcare center. We have multiple sites because we are taking care of children before and after they attend school. So as an example, it's a little bit dependent on different sites running, which then takes different staffing because we are licensed. Because we're licensed, families can take advantage of the assistance program that Greg was talking about that we are hoping will increase to what it should be because that way a lot of our families are going to be much more supported when it comes to accessing uh, child care uh, not only with us but in other uh, sites and so um, it's a little more complicated than that but that is the concept and and we're trying to we are that's what we did this august or this fall was we played with all those numbers and and we pulled that rate as an example down as far as we could where it wasn't going to make it solvent but it made it much more so, you know, closer, and we felt like parent, it would give parents a big enough drop that it might support some additional families. Any other questions? Mr. Rogers. Yeah, thank you, Chair Treem. If you'll just indulge me for a minute, I'm going to try to get some numbers lined up in this conversation and Ms. Olin can jump in if I get something wrong, because I think we're going to try to answer these questions later. So if you would indulge me and turn to page 106 of your budget book and turn to page 10 of, turn to page 16 of your packet, which is page 10 of Dr. Weiss's letter. And I apologize to do this here, but I, I think it will be time well spent. Page 106, page 106 of your budget book and page 16 of today's packet. For those of you who can endure it, I'm gonna walk through a couple of corrections here because we're gonna get confused without them. So under FY22 revised budget, the top number on page 16 of the packet says 27,264,600. That number should actually be 27,228,800. And the reason for that is that we just processed um, a transfer outside the cap, which reduced the amount subject to the cap. So that number is now 27, 28, 27, 228, 800. 
And so the difference between the FY23 educational request of 28 491 200 and this year's request of 27 228 800 is actually 1,262,400, which if you don't want to remember that number, it's correct in the budget summary in the back of the book. Um, so that's the key thing there, increase to the educational instructional portion. Um, and then again, if you'll indulge me on the rest of this outside the cap. So down in the far left-hand column of the change, it looks like a formula omitted the learn to swim $50,000 by, by mistake. So just write $50,000 in there, that is a change. So the total other programs change is 200,000, not 150. And the total requests outside the cap is 203,500. And the total request for funding down there is 1,430,000. But one more correction, in the FY22 revised column, total requests outside the cap at the bottom says 2,071,500. That is before the two supplementals. So there was a supplemental for 35,800 that was funding that we took out from underneath the cap and put it into activities, and then also $10,000 for ice time. So with those two corrections, that amount becomes not 2,071,500, but instead 2,117,300. And the difference between the FY23 budget request outside the cap of 2,275,000, 2, 2,275,000, and what you appropriated this year, including your supplementals of 2,117,300, the difference between those two numbers is 157,700. Okay, that, that was the numbers I was trying to get you to. So you will see on the decision list an additional request from the school district on top of its request from FY22, including the supplementals of 157.7 thousand. And already included in the manager's budget is the instructional portion up to the cap, 1,262,400. Ms. Olin, did I get any of that wrong? Okay. All right, so just needed to track and translate a little bit there. Otherwise, I, we were gonna get confused in a couple of weeks about the numbers. So I'm happy to, help anybody understand that. If you weren't paying along, paying attention along on pages 106 and 107, I just got all those numbers to match in the right places um, for what's in the budget book. So what's in the budget book with regard to the funding and expenditure requests is correct. We are having a little bit of back and forth about fund balance, what's going on fund balance, but in terms of the request to the city, I should have gotten you all on the right page. So page 106 is correct. Page 106 and page 107 are correct. Okay, clear as mud. That was, I know that was a lot to do right here, but I, I just wanted to try and anchor us yeah. in the right place. So no more questions? Okay. Um, we will see the school district's operating budget at a assembly meeting on the 25th. And then we will take action on the budget, uh, the outside the cap budget in a finance committee meeting on the 11th. So this is, not the last time we will be seeing any of this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sidden, Dr. Weiss, Ms. Olin, Mr. Brian Holst, <laughs> Mr. Holst, thank you <laughs> for being here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, Ms. Wall. No. Oh, she's just waving. Okay. Mr. Smith, do you need some snacks? Okay. You want to, do you guys want to keep going? Just flip through this? Yeah. Okay. So our next agenda item is the capital improvement plan. I will wait a couple minutes for uh, Director Custer and Mr. Bohan to get ready. Okay, we'll take two minutes.
<laughs> Thank you, Chair Treem. I'm going to uh, briefly uh, take you through our, our stock presentation that's been updated. And I debated not doing this, but then I learned so much when I reread it, uh, I, I thought I would go ahead and go through it. So first, I want to point out the first, uh, I just think the picture is really cool. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> so that was, I just think that's the coolest picture. There is uh, the bridge there in 1935. So anyway, thank you. Uh, first slide. Um, this is a summary of the CIP process, and you have a more detailed version of that in your cover memo, but basically staff starts in October collecting nominations from departments, um, scoping, working with departments on cost estimation, um, finance gives us numbers to work with, and uh, that culminates in a draft CIP that's presented to PWFC, and then what is my favorite uh, book that is all dog-eared and uh, battered is the six year CIP. We introduced that in March. This is a really valuable document because not only does it contain what we're requesting from the assembly this year, but it has some forward looking uh, information on our anticipated needs. And beyond that, it has, you know, fiscal year future, which is a, a kind of the greater picture of capital budget needs for the city and borough of Juneau. And then of course, uh, we are reviewed uh, by the finance committee by the Planning Commission, by SRRC, and pass the CIP with the budget. So next slide. This is how we uh, think about the CIP. We uh, kind of have it divided into different categories. And um, those categories have different values that uh, when we're working with departments and working with requesting agencies, we, uh, we can work with. So next slide goes into more detail on those categories. Again, I mentioned in December, we get numbers from finance based on revenue projections and then we build the CIP based on um, all the different uh, needs of the different departments and so we ask departments to submit prioritized lists and, and we work with them through that. Um, again this just goes into more detail on the uh, portion of the voter approved three percent tax that goes to uh, capital projects and that go that uh, portion of that sales tax is for uh, general government services like ambulances, parks and recreation, libraries, transit, and other those, those other agencies. We also have our 1% dedicated to area wide, wide streets. And that is a really important part of our maintenance budget and reconstructing streets, sidewalks, and stairs. And then we have 1% uh, for uh, general capital improvements, general government is capital improvements, and that's 1.7 million. So more detail uh, on the following pages of what is in the C uh, CIP this year, uh, general sales tax, that's your, your recreational, your uh, things that are under the manager's office like JPD and the CCFR. Uh, Ms. Hale. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Ms. Kester, if you could go back one slide. I, I just, uh, I'm just being a little dense here. Um, it says voter approved 3% sales tax, and then we have these categories of 1%, but then like the second category has 10.5 million and at 1%, and the third category has 1.7 million at 1%. And obviously there's not, that's, that's not trying to reflect 1%, but I don't quite know what it reflects. Yeah, so I will I will take a stab at that because uh, Bohan gave me that lesson. Um, he's given me that lesson multiple times. But one percent of the three percent uh, sales tax goes to general government operations. One uh, percent. This is like a test for me. I should just let him do it. But one uh, percent goes to um, area wide street sales tax. That's the street stairs, sidewalks, maintenance, and then a portion of that third one percent goes to general government services, that's the 1.7 million. Uh, the remainder of that third 1% goes to general government operations. So that's why, think of it like 1% equals $10.5 million. So we have that 1% for streets and uh, street sidewalks, stairs, that equals 10.5 million. And then we have a fraction of a 1% that equals 1.7 million for general government services. That was great, thank you. Did she pass, Mr. Bohan? <laughs> and, uh, Madam Chair, Ms. Gladyshevsky, just one thing that you said something about dedicated to these are all subject to appropriation. This is sort of the tradition that we've done. None of that has to happen this way. Just thank you for that clarification. You're absolutely right. And um, to quote 
Chair Treem, who was quoting Finance Director Rogers, all money is green and technically all the sales tax is general funds. So the assembly gets to uh, appropriate it however they wish. This is just how we have structured and how staff views the CIP when we compile it to present it to you. Mr. Watt. Uh, thank you, Chair. It, it's, uh, yeah, so no dedicated funds in the state of Alaska for governmental in, uh, entities, but it's the intent language that we take to the voters, and it's that longstanding tradition on the 3% uh, that we allocate it that way. So the voters uh, see language that says, if you approve this, we intend to spend the, the funds in this way. So just to go into a little bit more detail on the next slide on uh, what the area-wide street sales tax um, funds. Um, again, uh, priorities as, um, as decided by the street maintenance department in consul consultation with the utility, because we, we make decisions on the roads that we prioritize based not only in the condition of the pavement, but also the condition of the infrastructure underground. Um, some planning and scoping is funded under this. For example, there's funding in here for uh, feasibility and, and scoping for Lemon Creek multimodal path. Uh, bus shelters, we, we buy a number of bus shelters and replace them every year um, with this funding. Um, and then there are some kind of miscellaneous items uh, like match ones for um, the electric bus charging infrastructure. And there's uh, funding in here for staff time for the Juneau Douglas North Crossing. So those are the smaller elements, really the majority of this tranche of uh, funding goes to uh, street maintenance. So next slide. This is a, a important uh, portion of the CIP because it really feels like the uh, projects that, that maybe have are a little bit more visible to the community. And that's the voter approved special 1% sales tax. Um, that is approved through September 30th, 2023. So you will be talking about this, have already started talking about uh, this uh, 1%, but as city manager Watt mentioned, this is a, a special 1% that where the assembly um, has intent language to um, do certain projects and fund certain projects over a five year period. All right, so next slide. Also in the CIP, you will find funding for marine passenger fees. This is, um, there is of course a dedicated process to solicit nominations for marine passenger fees. It goes through the city manager's office and that process is still underway. So while we have these projects uh, listed in your CIP document, I acknowledge that it's more of a, a proposed, uh, more of a placeholder for proposed projects because the marine passenger fee funding is still working its way through the assembly process. And then the last category uh, in the document are enterprise funds. So that's receipt supported services uh, like um, water and wastewater, where we use uh, revenue from ratepayers to pay for projects, Bartlett Hospital, uh, the Lands and Resources Fund, and Docks and Harbors. So those, those uh, departments and divisions submit their requests based on their available funds. The next category is um, unscheduled funding. So this is money that the assembly is not appropriating, even though it's included in the document. But what it does do is provide a good picture of what's coming. So you have um, one section of, of unscheduled funding, which is kind of speculated or anticipated needs. A lot of times, this is where we let you know that we've uh, made uh, grant requests for certain appropriations and that we anticipate that these will be coming through the assembly process. So kind of trying to like paint that holistic capital picture. The second category, um, under uh, unscheduled funding is even more kind of uh, we, speculative, right? We, we have needs like the radio system, that's a, a long identified need that the assembly is aware of. We don't necessarily have funding identified for them, but wanna let, let you know that we're working on them. Uh, next slide, just you know, kind of to emphasize uh, that we really do work through the priority list as presented by the departments when we uh, work on giving you a document to start with. And there's a lot of good information in there because from the, the and those lists are included in this book. From there, you can see the needs of the different departments. And, and as 
you can imagine there are more needs in available funding. Uh, and if a project is unfunded and it's unscheduled funding, it often moves to the next year's priority list. You know, it's a bit of a living document, so you can't count on, you know, a project that says it's going to be funded in year five being funded, but it is a way for us uh, as staff to map out those capital needs. Next slide. So, um, you know, year after year, you will notice that the CIP is mostly a maintenance document. Mostly we're buildings, we're taking care of old streets and sidewalks and stairs and systems. Um, and that is the nature of uh, running a uh, organization with all those, those facility needs. There are some, a few things to call out in this CIP. And that is this year we requested departments to highlight if there was a sustainability element to their project. And um, quite a few are because anything, anytime you, uh, you know, fix an old roof or a new HVAC system, you're, you're improving the um, energy efficiency of that building. And so that is new information that's in the book before you today. And of course, there is funding for um, zero waste program. That's one of the assembly priorities. And um, there's also funding match money for the uh, capital transit bus chargers that are going to be installed at the Valley Transit Center. Um, a couple of items uh, to highlight, there's funding for the affordable housing fund in here. That's a, a reoccurring item. And then from a planning and scoping perspective, again, to highlight the, uh, the scoping money for Lemon Creek Multimodal Path and the Juno Douglas uh, North Crossing. So, you know, when I look at the, um, the CIP, as I've had the opportunity to now a couple of times, and, and I learn more every time, this really is our uh, principle. And, planning document for capital improvement needs. So you will see uh, legislative priority projects in this document because that's, you know, when we ask for a few hundred thousand dollars to move a legislative priority forward so that we can request funding for it, for example, that's, that's how we kind of make incremental progress on those projects. So think of the CIP six year book as, as the most holistic look that we have on our capital budget needs. And then, you know, we break it up from there. So Thank you for the time. And uh, City Engineer Bohan is happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Ms. Gladys Um, Thank you uh, for that. This is a great overview of this whole thing. So um, we have this little book stands by itself and then we every year make another list. And um, like the one that we prioritized and can we get eventually one list so it's all so when someone scrambles about at some point and says, here's a grant or here's the thing, and we, we could look in here just, we wouldn't have to make it up again. Because um, that's what we did again this, you know, every year somebody says, there's a X kind of funding and we don't always look at this book. We, we make up another list. That's the question. <laughs> How do we get a one list or can't we ever get one list to make an extra category in here or Mr. Watt. something? Uh, Chair Dream, I, I, I think we're all uh, looking at the deputy mayor, uh, looking for a better description of what you're after. We're a little confused. The, the, we made up a list uh, recently to um, ask for funding from various sources. The legislative priority, the legislative priority list. So that's its own little list all by itself, yet there's this list. And I understand this is mostly maintenance and stuff, but it's not all like the Lemon Creek's in here and that was on our list. So how do we ever get one list and not multiple lists? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'm gonna take a shot. Okay, awesome. Okay, if you would go to page 21 in your CIP book, it's the six year department improvement plan. Okay, and you see the administration category managers office, what I, the legislative priority list started a new life in the past year. So this is a new master list that we've just created. So what you'll see here in the future category is the listing of the legislative priorities that 
don't necessarily have a year for funding, but we're identifying them as our priorities on that list. And so as you go through multiple different departments, you will see those lists. There's only a dozen or 15 projects on the legislative priority list, but you'll see the different departments have more than that. So the past years, we haven't necessarily pulled, done a good job of pulling all of those projects out with the legislative priority list identified and we're starting to be able to categorize that into the book. So if you look at the F, what we call the FY future category, you'll start seeing more of that. And as the legislative priority list gets, if we're going to get say a draft, a, you know, a second page or a third page of it of longer projects and more identified projects, you'll start seeing more of those in here or you'll start, or you'll be able to start pulling from here to add to that list. Um, exactly what I was talking about. And so we have that here using Lemon's, Lemon Creek Fire Station, for example. We have no funding identified for it, but it's on the list as a future desire, um, as a future wish. So does are all the things on that that priority list on here then? The legislative priority Somewhere. list is encapsulated in here either through the manager's office because most of them live in the administrative realm at this point or docks and harbors for electrification, for example, um, possibly parks and rec for some of theirs. So as you scroll through the six-year plan, the, the six-year improvement plans, you'll see a lot of those pieces. Okay, no, that's great because then we won't have to start. I mean, the last when we did it last time, it sort of sounded like it wasn't. They weren't already there, so that now it's here, and then next time we need one, we look here first. It's here, and as we continue to gather more information from, say, the area development plans, and be able to, um, yeah, I'm good. Assemble projects. We'll be able to continue to build on that list. Thank you. Ms. Hill, did I see your hand? You didn't, but I do have a question. Okay. Oh, I'm psychic. It, it's <laughs> Go ahead. Amazing. So I, I, uh, I am pleased to see on page 12, uh, priority two, the sidewalk and stairway repa repairs, because I went up a set of stairs that I used to go up frequently recently, and I was stunned at how bad, what the terrible shape those stairs were in. And I know stairs are problematic because downtown moves around and so so do the stairs and i guess my question is how do you select which sets of stairs you're going to work on and is there a mechanism for the public to say hey these stairs that i live on are dangerous and does that kind of play into it sure through the chair um we have a couple of challenges. Obviously, if there are dangerous or hazardous situations, please reach out to either engineering department or the street department who are in charge of maintaining those. Um, we do, you know, the street department does a routine inspection of all of them. And again, we're in a position where we have more problems than money to address. We are in another situation currently of contractor availability. Um, we tried to bid a set of stairs to be repaired this spring and received no contractor bids. And so we are in, you know, we're in a catch 22. So we're trying to figure out that problem as well as moving forward to make, you know, make smaller repairs as necessary to improve the stairways to, to fix the major hazards, but we're trying to rehabilitate all of the stairs, which is why you see a much larger number in here this year than past years. Um, but we are also in a, you know, in a worker shortage contractor availability time where we're going to be doing band-aid repairs compared to full to full rebuilds, which is what most of our stairways require. Thank you very much. And Ms. Hill, part of your question is a good segue. Um, the, the question of how would a member of the public raise that they could bring it to one of us certainly because we do have the ultimate decision making power in this document and Mr. Rogers when we're all done with this is going to tell us uh, how we might bring those things up during this budget cycle if we need to or feel that we want to. So. Thank you Madam Chair. 
Um, I have a question on the enterprise funds. The the slide says that Docks and Harbors has no funding requests, but I feel like that can't. They, they have projects they're working on, right? Does this do they truly not have projects they want to work on the next year? Is this no funding requests from these certain funding sources? Uh, Madam Chair, that's a they, they still have some existing capital funding that doesn't lapse. Um, the CIP funding does not lapse. So they're, they're still working on some smaller projects, but they didn't feel they were positioned well to nominate new projects at the time because they were uncertain of say the Corps of Engineers providing funding for them this year or the UAS property purchase. So if, if those do come up to a point where they need to fund them, they would request supplemental a supplemental appropriation. They, they just were not in a position at that time to nominate funding because they're still very short on funding and they have a lot of operations to fund this year. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is this the time to ask about specific projects or do is that a later discussion or? What's yeah, the... I think we have time to do that now. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I wanted to, I've, I've been hearing from some folks about parking out at Montana Creek slash Hank Harmon gun range. Um, I see there's something in the unscheduled funding, 600,000, but that looks like it might be safety access. And then there, I think there's Montana Creek again in parks and rec or something. Um, that any work on that is, is there any funding for, for starting to make, to do anything out there in this CA in this in the FY23 CIP through the chair Mr. Smith or members assembly member Smith um, we had a, we had received a comment from the public as well and parks and rec had identified that as their first non maintenance CIP as it being new development and unfortunately it did not fall within the amount of available funding that they were allocated so it's on their priority list. If you go back to, let me find it, on their six year plan, they have listed it. It's on page 26, down partway at the bottom of the page. They have, they requested 350,000 for Montana Creek Recreation Area Parking as priority five, but they deemed their maintenance priorities more important than funding that. Hello? Just curious, and maybe it's just a process thing. So then the Hank Harmon safety access grant, which is was on the unscheduled list, but it's a lower priority. How does how does that work? Do you know how and maybe it's getting quite into the weeds, sorry. I, I oh, Madam Chair. Go ahead. So we were Smith. I believe they had received some bond funding a year or so ago for some Hank Harmon repairs, and they are working on leveraging that with grant money from Fish and Game. And so essentially the free money or the grant money goes under the unscheduled. If they happen to receive it, it would be an assembly action to appropriate it at that time. It just shows up under unscheduled because they do have a grant application in process. So they're trying to leverage the bond money they had to work on much more, much more information. Mr. Watt. Uh, th thank you, Chair. So, so uh, Parks and Rec does support that project. They, they're looking to kind of deconflict some of the uses out there in, in lieu of being able to get funding for the larger project. They're pursuing a smaller project. Uh, where I think they're trying to get 10 to 15 parking spaces using some of the uh, trail CIP because it's trail users that are using the gun range parking lot. Uh, so I've been getting an update uh, from Mr. Schaff on that and Ms. Elfers. Any more questions? Okay, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, thank you, Chair Treem. I'm going to do a, there, there are not corrections here, but I'm going to try and connect us back to the budget book a little bit because um, I do think it helps. So page 75 and 76 is where you'll see the CIP in the budget book. Um, 
I know that I'm not trying to torture you. I'm trying to <laughs> convince you that all these things are actually in the budget book. <laughs> um, so on page 75 in the middle of the page, you can see a very basic comparison of last year's um, CIP to this year's CIP. And, and I'll just walk you through the deltas real quick. So general capital projects went from 1.5 to 1.7, so that's $200,000. The temporary 1%, meaning street sales tax basically went, basically went from um, 9.7 to 10.1, so that's an extra $400,000. And then area-wide uh, for projects, went uh, from uh, 9.6 to 10.5, that's $900,000. So that's the million and a half, 200,000, 400,000, 900,000 is the additional million and a half. So we keep saying an additional million and a half sales tax for CIP. It's those three constituent pieces. Um, if you look on page 76, um, you will see that additional million and a half dollars. So middle of the page, support from sales tax. There's a lot of information on this page, but just trying to get you to the right places. Uh, the 22 projected is 20.8 million. So the delta from, from that to next year is 22.3 million is a million and a half. Right below that, you'll see in the FY23 column, 4.095 um, from uh, passenger fees. And I'm just gonna make a quick note about that. Um, uh, Assemblymember Smith just asked if there were no, pro uh, no projects for docks and harbors. That's true. There are no projects this year funded from the docks or harbors funds, but uh, note that there are two projects funded by passenger fees for the docks enterprise. One is dock electrification, and the other one was uh, marine station weather monitoring, I think. Um, so the, just note that there are two dock priorities in there that were funded by passenger fees rather than dock funds. And then at the bottom of the 22 projected actuals column, you'll see general funds, 17.7 million. That's kind of an unprecedented number to have spent on general funds, but you did that already this year. Um, and those things are, and I'll just go through them quick because I think it makes sense to keep track of this stuff. Uh, five and a half million for Statter Seawalk, five and a half million for deferred maintenance, two, two million for the gondola, two million for the Harris Harbor Boatyard, two million for Capital Civic Center, and seven hundred thousand dollars for budget processing. So that's five and a half, five and a half, two, 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 seven, and seventeen point seven million in general funds. So that's that's things you did in uh, FY22 that were really anomalous based on really unprecedented circumstances, but um, just trying to root you into what's changing and what's not in, in between a couple of years that have been anything but normal. Um, and, and just to point you to the couple of pages in the budget book where this is cataloged. Uh, that was it, thank you, Chair. Sure. Mr. Smith. Thanks, and just to make help me remember, so that five and a half for Statter, I, I, I mean, I obviously, you know, it's coming from the general fund, but wasn't the linkage or the nexus there to money we received from the state replacing marine passenger fees? Okay, so there was, I mean, there was. That's correct. So Chair Treem, we, we received almost $13 million in passenger fees into the general fund. There was a decision made to spend a portion of that money that was received into the general fund on a passenger fee type uh, project, which was uh, Statter and Seawalk. Um, and, and and I might just remark too, also Harris Harbor Bart Boatyard kind of generally fits in the marine enterprise conversation. To take it back a step, like magic, Director Schaff appeared when we were talking about Parks and Rec. Did you have anything you wanted to add on that project? No. Okay. Okay. Mr. Smith. And just another thing, just because I'm seeing I'm seeing airport FAA project match six hundred thousand. So we are we're. That's, oh, right. The, uh, the issue that's come up a couple of times was about debt service, right? So that's completely unrelated, but we are providing an FY23, $600,000 to the airport through the, through the CIP. Um, so, and I'm looking on page three of, or five of, four, five of the CIP book. And in in it's in the temporary 1% sales tax priorities. Wait, what page? Page three of the of the Okay. It it is. 
So Chair Treem, Mr. Smith is looking at uh, page three of the CIP booklet, second section down, the very last line, airport FAA project max 600,000. Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so, but it is proposed, I mean, assuming we were to pass it, I mean, we, it is proposed to that the, we were providing 600,000 to the airport for project match. Correct, okay. Yeah, that, that is correct. And that was part of the voter approved special 1%. So that was programmed when we approved, when the 1% was approved and they were programmed out to FY23 to receive part of their match funds. So any anything that gets approved as part of that 1% shows up in here, even if it's not what we typically kind of consider a capital project, like the affordable housing fund transfer. Is that correct? Ms. Glashev. So regarding the airport one, but we talked about having them pay the debt. So now I'm confused if this is has something to do with that or not. Mr. Rogers. I'll take that one. So just it's separate. So this is $600,000 that's made available via the 1% as matched to federal projects. So this is from the 1% sales tax. The other $660,000 is general obligation bonds that okay. were authorized many years ago. Just the numbers are the same, so then I got Correct. all. So I get it. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, can you uh, tell us a process for making amendments to the CIP? Yeah, thank you. So uh, the chair has asked the finance department to facilitate um, a process whereby members of the finance committee could, could recommend uh, changes to the CIP. And, and here's what I'm gonna propose for consideration. I think that probably um, the committee is gonna want to be able to start reviewing committee proposals on May 4th. And in order for the finance department to be able to get something from you, get it into a format where you all can look at it, work with departments to understand what the costs might be, get a little bit of narrative. The finance department is gonna ask for those CIP proposals to be back to us. And I, I guess I could just ask you to send them to me or send them to me and the manager by April 25th. So April 25th uh, will be the deadline for members of the committee to submit to, to the finance department uh, recommended changes to the recommended amendments to the CIP. And we will consolidate those, get them into a list uh, for consideration and potentially decision-making on the fourth. Any questions on that process? This is um, new, at least in my time here. I actually don't think that in any of the budget cycles I've been through, there have been any amendments to the CIP, um, but I had a couple of ideas this year uh, that I mentioned at one of the public works committee meetings recently. So Mr. Rogers came up with this process. If anybody else has things they'd like to add, um, work with Mr. Rogers and we can present them. Mayor Weldon. It has happened in the past, but typically when we approve the CIP, they're just amendments, but his way might be a little more efficient. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we've covered it all. For this week looking for confirmation over there some nods okay our next meeting will be next wednesday we're adjourned